Hello everyone! In this video, we start the retelling of the Manha. Cry even better if you beg. Part 1 to 3. We ask you to support our channel by liking and subscribing if you like this video. This Manhawa is a tragedy, but with an incredibly spiritually strong main character, a beautiful girl. In the description under the video there are time codes, with which you can quickly switch to the right part of the video. Here we go. Layla, in the spring, when the flowers bloom, let's go to the park together was her father's promise, which later became a will. Layla's father died, and the little girl with golden hair and bright green eyes was forced to travel to find a roof over her head. With just one bag in her hand, she boarded a train and traveled to her relatives. For this child, spring never came again. The life of the little girl, who found herself alone in the world, and had to constantly move from relative to relative to relative, was truly terrible. So she first went to her aunt, in whose family lived several children, namely boys. The cousins did not accept Layla into their family, and began to abuse her in every possible way. They grabbed her by the hands and held a heising, an initiation ritual, so that she would enter as a real member of the family. But the ritual was brutal. Unable to swim, the girl was thrown into the water, far from the shore. On the way, the girl fought back and begged to be released, but the boys replied that in that case she must leave their home and they would surrender her to an orphanage. Throwing her into the water, they shouted that her own mother had abandoned her, so why should she live with them? When the girl reached the house and got out of the water, she was immediately punched in the face by her aunt's husband. The man said that ever since they took this girl into their home, they had been having bad luck and continued to beat Layla. On days when he was losing money gambling, no one could stop his cruel abuse. The aunt in tears tried to stop her husband when Layla was already lying unconscious in her own blood. But the drunken husband demanded that she let her go. The aunt was afraid that her husband would one day kill the girl. For Layla, this time became a living hell. But she was a small child who could do nothing but endure and wait. Still, the misfortunes piled up like the snow that fell all night. With the coming of winter, Standing outside in her light clothes, Layla told her aunt that she would sit quietly in a corner and stay out of the way, just so she wouldn't leave her here alone. But the woman, pulling her arms out of the girl's embrace, told Layla to go to her other relatives and ask them to take her in. There was longing and sadness in the aunt's eyes she herself was tired of her husband. She told Layla that she was suffering in her family, so it would be better for the girl to leave them. Once again the girl was kicked out into the street. After that she went to other relatives. Some said that she would be of little use to them and they would only spend more money on food. The second said with a menacing shout that they were not going to let such a suspicious girl into their house, who had been kicked out into the street for no apparent reason. They thought she had certainly done something to deserve it. Third relatives, who already had many children, answered that they could not take her in, they would like to reduce the number of mouths in the family even though it was impossible. Nobody took the poor orphan into their home. But the last of the relatives suddenly asked Layla if she knew Burko. Then he wrote something on a paper, handed it to the girl and told her to go there and find the man whose name was on the note. He in turn promised to warn that person of her arrival. This is how the child traveled from Rabida, where she was born and raised, to Burko, taking a train across the border. Sitting in the carriage, and looking at the piece of paper, Layla held out a little hope for the unfamiliar name. And so, she finally arrived at the Carlsbar station of Burko State. The girl got off the train, and merging into the crowd began to think about whether she would be able to find the right person. After all, if she didn't find him, she wouldn't be able to go back to Robita anyway. She shook her head from side to side and told herself not to think about it. Burko was Layla's father's home country, so she knew the local language. On peaceful days when she was little, her parents had smiled as they watched their daughter speak two languages, and called her a genius. So Layla decided to ask for directions. There was a mailman walking toward the exit. Layla caught up with him and after greeting him, showed him a piece of paper with his address and name on it. Then she asked him if he could tell her the way to this place. The man read the note, and it listed the gardener of the Duchy of Gerhardt as Bill Remer. Afterward the letter carrier said he knew Bill, and was carrying a letter to him so he called the girl to follow him, as he himself had to go to that address. They rode in a carriage. Leela gazed rapturously at the trees and gardens that lined the sides of the road and saw the view that opened on Count Gerhardt's vast estate. 
The landscape looked as if it had come from the pages of a fairy tale. As she looked around, Layla wondered what kind of person was the man who worked as a gardener in such a beautiful place. Would he accept her? At that moment, Layla saw a man ahead with a straw hat on his head who was digging in the ground. He fixed his hair, straightened his back, and approached him with a polite smile. She apologized for disturbing him and asked if his uncle's name was Bill Ramir. The man turned to the girl and with a menacing look replied that he was indeed Bill Ramir. Layla tensed and became nervous at the sight of the scowling man, but began to mentally reassure herself, for all the way on the train she had rehearsed her speech. She greeted her uncle and introduced herself as Leela Livillin. Then with a smile she said she came from Rubita. The man said with an indifferent look that he knew at once from her pronunciation that she was not from their region, for the accent was pronounced. He then asked how she had crossed the border? The girl replied that she had come by train. Uncle Ramur then asked what business the girl had with him. Leela was confused, she thought he had already been warned of her arrival, but the man certainly didn't know anything. At that moment the letter carrier ran up to Bill and handed him a letter. The gardener in turn asked the peddler if he had brought the girl here. The letter carrier said he had met her at the station, she told him she was looking for Reamer, and he had brought her here. The letter was from Robita, from the same relative, and it came with Leela. Bill immediately unsealed the envelope and began to read the contents. The letter said that one child was coming to visit Bill the daughter of Albot Livellin, named Layla. Her mother had long ago fallen in love with someone else and left home. Because of this, Albot went on a bender and eventually died of illness. Now this kid is making the rounds of all the relatives, but everyone is not in the best position. Although it was a long time ago, but the author of the letter heard that Bill worked as a gardener in the estate of a famous duke. And of all the relatives with whom the child had even a ghostly connection, Rimmer's situation seemed the best, so they sent her to the estate. Bill Rimmer was outraged, since there was not even a ghostly connection between him and Albot. They were related but in reality were complete strangers to each other. Was he really being offered to raise the child of a relative he had last seen 20 years ago? That he, widower Bill Rimmer, should raise this little girl? The letter postscript said that if the situation didn't allow Bill to keep the girl, he could surrender her to an orphanage. The gardener crumpled up the letter and began to lament that those relatives were just crazy and there wasn't enough to kill them. Is that really what grown men do? They sent that little girl alone to another country and they didn't care at all what might happen to her, whether she would die or fall into the wrong hands. Leela at first thought he was angry that she had come to him and was surprised when he started criticizing the adults. Rimmer looked at the girl and noted that she was only wearing a dress, even though it had only recently been winter and it was still very cold, and other than one bag she had no belongings. She looked very thin and thin and it was clear that she had been through a lot of bad things. Rimmer doomedly covered his face with his hand and continued to mutter unhappily to himself. Layla called out to him, calling him Uncle Bill Rimmer and standing up on her toes to make herself appear taller, she told him that she would be 12 in a few weeks, so she wasn't as small as she might seem. She can also read, and will help with any job he says. The man was greatly surprised. The sun was setting, Rimmer threw the shovel into the cart, and told Layla to follow him. He said they should eat first, and then think about what to do next. Bill lived in a hut on the estate, closer to the woods, so that he could go outside and work in the garden. The house was small, but very cozy. The girl looked around and noted in her mind that there were no other members of the family Bill was alone. The man turned to the girl and asked why she had put so little food on her plate. Layla answered her uncle that she didn't eat much. The gardener said he didn't like children who didn't eat well, so she should eat with gusto, like a cow. Layla blinked a few times and began to put more food on her plate. She said it would be hard to eat like a cow, but she would eat well. Bill thought that she must have eaten with an eye on others before and couldn't afford a bigger portion. Suddenly Rimmer, with a very stern look, asked the girl why she wasn't afraid of him. Leila replied that he doesn't yell at her or hit her, and he even gave her delicious food. So she was grateful to him, and sincerely said that he was a good man. Bill felt his heart break if Leila was thanking him for such simple things, what was she going through? He felt sorry for her, but at the same time he didn't think he could raise her. It sounded absurd. He didn't know where he should put the baby, 
so he decided to think about it for the next week. Her uncle told Layla that until he settled the matter she could stay to live in his house. In the morning she dressed, put on her apron, and wondered where she would have to go after this house. When would her endless journey of wandering end? Then she went into the kitchen and asked how her uncle had slept. And hearing the answer that it was not bad, she offered to help him set the table and set out the plates. They sat down at the table, and Bill set Layla a large portion. She smiled at the joke that she would eat like a cow, and thanked him. Meanwhile, in the Duke's mansion, word had already spread among all the servants that the gardener had taken the girl in. Some of them thought that such a serious statue was not capable of raising a girl properly. Some thought that if he was recognized by the Duchess, the best gardener of all, could grow flowers so skillfully, he could also raise a child. Others wondered how he could have a child at all, his wife was long dead and they certainly had no children. One of the valets called the others to the window, for he noticed that Bill was walking down the street with the girl. The servants crowded around the windows, each of them eager to see the little girl. Layla was carrying a pot with a plant in it. Everyone was amazed at her golden hair and that she looked so small. Full of adversity, the story of the lonely orphan Layla Lavellin quickly spread among the servants, and they learned of the girl's long journey until she found a roof over her head in their manor. After everyone knew everything, Layla brought a bouquet of flowers to the manor. The maids met her and handed her a roll of cookies. When Layla left, they sadly said that Bill would probably chase away such a sweet girl. But every time Ramur was asked about it, he said he hadn't decided anything yet. As spring passed in his thoughts and it was getting to summer, the image of Layla following Bill Ramur and helping him with his work became a familiar landscape. And looking at the two of them, all as one, the servants of the Gerhardt house gave their verdict. Bill Rimmer, Arvis's best gardener, is a man whose talent extends only to growing flowers. One of the maids came to Bill's house with a basket containing cookies and cake they were left over for my lady's tea party. The man replied that he hated sweets, but the woman said she'd brought it for Layla. Bill said that lately, everyone had been staggering into his house disguised as Layla. Some brought clothes, some brought books, and some even bought writing utensils, though it wasn't like them at all. Even the missus who never came to Bill's house and rarely spoke to him had brought something for Layla. Plus, sometimes people would stop by just to see Layla, and the whole thing gave Ramur a headache. The woman replied that it was all because Layla is really nice. This little girl is so polite and cheerful that the desire to take care of her comes on its own. It's also cute how she hops around the forest and garden, just like a squirrel. Especially after the Duke grew up, there were no more children in the house so all the attention was focused on her. While the maid was reminiscing about how refined the young duke was, Layla, who was walking in the courtyard, climbed up a tree to examine a bird sitting on a branch. The woman, noticing this, shouted for Rimmer to make the girl climb down immediately, but the gardener only smirked. He said he didn't know who had taught it to Layla, but the skill was definitely useful. The maid started yelling at Bill that he was teaching the girl a bad thing and she should be as dainty as a flower. The woman asked if the gardener planned to raise Layla to be a tomboy like him. She immediately pictured the horrible picture of the girl becoming outwardly like her uncle. Bill replied to MS. Monet that it was all nonsense, and the main thing was that she should grow up healthy. The woman then asked what Bill had decided about the girl. The man replied that he hadn't decided anything and didn't know where to give her. There was only the option of an orphanage, but he was worried that Layla would not do well in an orphanage. He didn't want her to be in pain like she had been in his past. Layla promised her uncle that she wouldn't go far and went for a walk in the woods. The height of summer had begun, and the girl enjoyed contemplating nature. Every day she grew, and the forest grew with her. She watched the birds and picked forest berries. One day Layla saw a nest with eggs in it and began to look at them with delight. There were deer and other harmless animals walking everywhere. Leela especially liked the view of the river. She sat on the branch of a huge tree and drew sketches of birds with a pencil in her notebook. She drew so that the memories of this paradisiacal place would not be erased from her mind, but if they did disappear, she could look at her drawings and remember. When Layla got home, she found that her uncle was wearing a suit, which meant he was going somewhere. The man said he had somewhere to go, so she should get ready and follow him. The girl got worried, but her uncle explained that he only wanted to go to town with her to buy clothes, as Duke Gerhardt would be returning to the estate soon, and he needed to be greeted in a beautiful dress. 
In the dress she was wearing now it was inappropriate to greet him. As they walked down the path into town, Leela asked Uncle Bill if the Duke was the owner of this entire estate. The man replied that he was indeed, with the Duke having been given that title at the age Leila was now. He was studying now but every vacation, at the end of the semester he returned to his home, in Arvis. At 18 the Duke had nothing to do but study. Leela was shocked that there was only six years difference between her and the Duke. The young Duke arrived at the train station and was greeted by two whole rows of subjects. They walked outside and the Duke saw a carriage in front of him. The butler apologized and explained that my lady did not trust automobiles at all and had asked to get to the estate by this means of transportation. The Duke knew this, his grandmother still thought cars were nasty and dangerous pieces of iron. He didn't mind taking a carriage ride for a change, it had been a long time since he had sat in them. At the manor the Duke's arrival was already being anticipated. Maids, servants, Billy and little Layla, dressed in a white lace dress, stood in formation waiting. As they rode in the carriage the butler informed the Duke that he had prepared some reports. It was a schedule of social receptions for the time the young man would spend in Arvis. The chief of the servants told the others that they must not make a single mistake today, and must act impeccably. One of the maids asked Layla why she wore such a beautiful dress was it to greet the Duke? The girl said that it was so, and that this dress was bought for her by her uncle. Bill smiled faintly at these words. The carriage arrived at the place. The young man got out of it and immediately greeted the elderly duchess's grandmother, and then his mother. She said in response that her son had grown even taller. The grandmother said that dinner was ready and immediately walked with her grandson into the manor. Layla looked down the whole time and could only see the shoes of the young duke. She then asked her uncle if the duke had already left. He said he had, so they would have to greet him later. On the way to his house, Rimmer asked the girl if she was upset. Leela replied that she was a little, because he, for the sake of it, had bought her a beautiful dress. The man said it was nothing, and the girl would see the Duke often now, so they could still ask for permission to introduce her. Leila asked if the Duke liked the woods too. Bill said that in a way yes it was more accurate to say that the Duke loved hunting. Leila stopped and asked if he had hunted in this forest. Bill replied that of course this forest was the family's hunting grounds and it was natural. Layla lowered her head and asked if the Duke hunted birds too? Her uncle walked forward and said that it was probably the birds that the Duke liked to aim at the most. He also added that despite his young age, the Duke was a celebrated marksman, and if Layla got to see him shoot she would be amazed. Layla asked if it was impossible not to kill the animals, for even without hunting, there was enough food on the estate. Bill said that for the gentlemen among the aristocrats, hunting was an entertainment. Birds were the most interesting target, for they were small and flew fast, so they added to the excitement. At this point he turned around and saw faint tears come to the girl's eyes. She said she hoped the Duke would fall out of love with hunting. Rimmer realized he had said something he shouldn't have, and Layla began to ask if it was possible that the Duke would dislike hunting. A week passed. Layla was once again cheerfully walking through the forest. She came to a tree with a nest of tit eggs in its hollow. When she heard the chirping, she stood up and saw that the chicks had finally hatched. She counted five chicks, lay down on a branch and admired the cute little birds. She noticed that they were hungry, and told the little ones that their mom would be back soon with food. At that moment the last memory of her mom came to mind. Standing with the suitcases, she handed the girl a jar of blue-colored candy, and told her that she would be back very late. Layla asked if she would be able to arrive by the time she had eaten all the lollipops. Her mom said she would but she never came to see her daughter again. At that moment the girl noticed a tit with a caterpillar in its beak. She jumped down from the tree so as not to scare the bird, and from the ground she watched as it flew into the hollow and began to feed its babies. Afterwards she went to the river, sat down on the tree again and began to draw the chicks. She liked their fluffy, sparse feathers which would soon change to adult feathers. She knew that chicks leave the nest two weeks after hatching, which meant that soon she would be able to see the chicks fly. The thought made the girl excited. She put the notebook in her bag and decided to go down to tell her uncle about it. But before she got down she saw a man in a suit and cap sitting on a horse. She froze, wanting to leave as soon as he passed but he got off the horse, leaned against a tree, and took off his cap. At that moment Layla almost fell out of the tree and making a loud rustle, clung to the trunk. 
The young man immediately reacted to the noise and lifted his head up, and immediately took aim with his rifle. Leela panicked at the fact that she had almost been shot, and getting very worried, asked not to be shot. She wanted to leave as soon as he passed on. He asked her who she was. The woman confusedly said her name was Leela Livelin, and then ran off to her uncle. When she came running to him she called out to him which made Rimmer flinch. He asked what was wrong and the girl said she saw a man in the woods he was tall, with black hair and blue eyes. And his voice was so smooth like the feather of a waterfowl. He had a gun and then other people came to see him. The uncle laughed and said that Leela had met Duke Gerhardt, who was out hunting. The girl was immediately upset and remembered her uncle saying that it was birds that the Duke especially liked to shoot. Gunshots rang out. Leila's hands twitched to cover her ears. Rimmer told her to go inside, upset that she'd heard her forest friends being killed. Matthias von Gerhardt is the heir to an honorable family that is said to have everything but a king. The innate qualities and nobility of an aristocrat, reserved in graceful manners. People nicknamed him the masterpiece of House Gerhardt. Everyone genuinely cared for him and loved him. But only one person living in his domain, Leila Livelin, thought otherwise. When he came to the forest, even in a day many birds lost their lives, what to speak of their numbers in weeks. Birds were an interesting target for him, because the smaller the animal, the harder it was to hit. Not only that, but he didn't even pay attention to the game he hit. Even if they were dying, bleeding to death, he would just walk away, leaving them behind. Recently, a mother tit died, carrying food to her babies all day long. The weak chicks, left without a mother, were also unable to survive, when Leila found them dead, she cried for a long time. After all, they had died without ever leaving the nest. Duke had been visiting the forest for the past month and Leila, who had been burying the bodies of the cold dead birds, had decided to call him that the handsome, cruel bird killer. Though it was her personal opinion. One afternoon, Leila looked out the window. Her uncle approached her and held out his hand, offering her a seat in the clearing. He spread a blanket over the grass, and told the girl to sit under a willow tree while he and the other men worked. Layla was ashamed that she couldn't help when she tried to do so, her uncle made her sit back down and told her that if she followed him he would scold her. He added that he hated children who didn't listen to what they were told, and offered the girl some peaches to eat if she was hungry. Layla hugged her knees and sank her head down. Suddenly an unfamiliar boy with white hair ran up to her. He leaned over and greeted the girl. He sat down next to her and said he hadn't seen her here before. She said she lived with Uncle Bill. The boy asked if Uncle Bill was the scary gardening uncle. Layla said the uncle wasn't scary but the boy said he was afraid of him. Layla asked the boy if he lived on the estate, he replied that he came with his dad. His papa is the attending physician to the Duke's family and came today for a routine checkup on old milady. Sometimes the boy came with him. My lady herself gave him permission. Afterward, Layla continued to sit silently. The boy bent his head toward her and examined her. Then he asked her how old she was. She replied that she was 12. The boy was surprised and said they were the same age, yet the girl seemed much younger. She said he was little too. The boy began to stretch his neck up and said proudly that he was the tallest in his class. Layla said he was obviously smaller than Uncle Bill. Then the boy said that there was no one taller than her uncle, even among adults. Layla then replied that it didn't matter to her and he was small anyway. The boy said that was too much. He continued to sit next to her and said that it was very fresh today, probably because they were sitting in the shade of a tree. Leela didn't answer and only wondered how much longer this boy planned to sit next to her. He was all glowing with his appearance and he was definitely having fun, while the girl felt awkward in the presence of a stranger. She took a peach and a knife and started cutting it in half. The boy said she was amused since girls don't carry knives in their bags. Layla said Uncle Bill had given her the knife. She held out half a peach to the boy and asked if he would have one. He gratefully took the treat and savored the flavor of the fruit. Afterward, he asked why she was so unhappy. Maybe she had something going on? Layla shared that the Duke and his friends were always hunting birds. The boy asked what was the big deal. Layla explained that they were killing them just for fun. The young boy asked wasn't that what hunting was invented for? Layla asked, wasn't he exactly the same way? The boy got nervous and immediately began to say that he wasn't like that and he felt sorry for the animals. 
Layla was surprised at the answer. Even though the boy only said that to please her, she thought he was weird but it turns out he was quite nice. She handed him another peach half and asked him if he wanted more. The boy blushed and accepted the fruit. After a while the boy was called to him by his mother. He stood up from the clearing and held out his hand to Leela, introducing himself by the name Kyle Etman. He then asked her what her name was. The girl shook his hand and identified herself as Leela Livelin. Kyle said it was nice to meet her and ran off to his mom's house. As he said goodbye, he yelled that next time he would bring her something delicious himself. But Layla wasn't sure they would ever see each other again. She knew that Uncle Bill hadn't decided where to give her or keep her, and she expected that the time would come soon when she would have to go to an orphanage. Mom asked Kyle what kind of girl was that. He replied that she lived at his gardener uncle's house and they were the same age as her. The woman put her arm around her son's shoulder and glanced at Layla before walking away. When Uncle Bill finished his work, he called Layla to him to come down the hill. On the way he asked her if she was hungry. The girl replied that she had recently eaten peaches. She then said that she had met a boy who was her age. At that moment Layla noticed that the Duke was returning from a hunt in the company of his friends and was walking past them. While the friends chatted about the hunt, the Duke walked in silence and glanced at Layla passing by. Their gazes crossed. Uncle Bill took off his hat and bowed to the young Duke. The man told Rimmer that it had been a long time since they had seen each other. Bill said he was embarrassed to say it just now, for now he was going to leave this child in Arvis. And after saying that he pointed to Layla, who was standing behind him. Layla took a step forward and kept looking down. Rimmer said that both mistresses were already aware of it, and after getting their permission he thought he should inform the Duke, or it would be rude of him. Layla bowed, trying to cover her face with her long hair. One of the Duke's friends recognized Layla and said that she was the girl who lived in the forest. She was always hiding behind the trees, and when they left she would bury the birds they shot with tears. The young man talked about it with a laugh. The Duke remembered that it was a girl who had been sitting in a tree and whom he had nearly shot mistaking her for a bird. He then told Rimmer that he could do as he wished. Bill thanked the gentleman, and he, with his company, moved on. Leela looked up and saw them carrying several dead birds in their hands. Uncle Bill patted her on the shoulder and told her it was time to go home. There were guests at the Duke's mansion, a girl named Claudine and her mother. The young girl bowed her head, resting her cheek on the palm of her hand, and her excited mother asked her to behave as a lady should. Claudine said she was very bored. Her mother told her daughter that she could go play with her older brothers then. Claudine said they acted like she didn't exist. They also chatted about things that only they understood. Duchess, holding her dog, said that it was no wonder Claudine was bored. After all, there were no friends her age here. Claudine turned to her mother and said that Madame Gerhardt understood her. She then pointed her finger at a girl walking down the street and asked who she was. She also said that they looked to be the same age and wanted to know if they could play together. Madame Gerhardt said she didn't even know if they should play together, it was an orphan who had come to them from abroad. She was hardly the kind of child who could be a play companion for Claudine. Claudine told Mrs. Gerhardt that it was alright and it would be more fun than playing with a puppy. Her mother had almost run out of patience with her daughter for showing so little respect and not showing her parenting. Madame Gerhardt rang the bell and told the maid to bring the girl the gardener was raising to them. The girl came running to Rimmer and said that Madame had told her to bring Layla. Bill asked why she suddenly wanted to see her. The maid replied that the lady of the Brand family said she wanted to play with Layla. Rimmer turned towards the gentleman resting on the veranda and thought, why would a noble lady who has tons of entertainment need to call Layla to play? In any case, it was an order from the mistress, and he couldn't refuse. Layla told her uncle that she would go to mistress house, and would return home later. He replied okay and let the girl go. The maid brought Layla in. This was the first time she had seen Madame Gerhardt up close and was struck by her beauty. The mistress called Layla nice and asked Claudine if she was satisfied. She replied that she liked everything and thanked Madame Gerhardt. Layla didn't understand what the word like meant when it was said to her. In this place where people wore candy-colored clothes, no one seemed to care about Layla's feelings. Soon the mistress called for a maid and gave her an order. The maid took Layla by the hand and took her to a place the girl had never seen before. 
The maid washed Layla in a luxurious bathroom and dressed her in surprisingly white and soft clothes. She dried her hair and began to brush it. The maid's touch was quite rough and painful, but Layla endured it all. It seemed to her that she was obliged to endure. She clenched her hands on her dress for the sake of not complaining out loud over her hair being pulled out with the comb. She held on because it was an order from mistress. If she said one wrong word, Uncle Bill might get in trouble, and that was what she was worried about. When she was ready, the maid told Layla that Miss Claudine was the Earl of Brant's daughter. She is a person that Layla cannot behave carelessly with, and she must remember that. Layla said she understood, and they went into the room. Claudine greeted Layla again and told her to come closer to her. Claudine asked the girl what her name was and how old she was. She answered that her name was Layla Lavellan and she was 12. Claudine said she thought Layla was younger. It was the second time that day that she had been told that she looked small for her age. Layla had to swallow her indignation for Uncle Bill's safety. Claudine sat down at the piano and asked the girl if she knew how to play the piano. Layla replied that she didn't know how and thought about the fact that it was the first time she had ever seen a piano that big. Claudine started to play a tune and asked Layla if she knew the song and could sing it. Layla replied that she didn't know and was hearing it for the first time. Claudine said they would leave the music and ask the girl if she knew how to make artificial flowers. Layla answered that she didn't. A few more questions came. But Layla didn't know how to play dice or cards, and she didn't know how to play chess either. Claudine was disappointed, bored again and called Layla a poor girl. The girl stood up and with an indifferent look told Layla that she was a child who knew absolutely nothing and could do nothing. Then she left the room, telling the maid with annoyance that she had hoped she would have fun, turned around one last time, and said that Layla was no better than a puppy. Layla lowered her head and continued to sit still, clutching the fabric of her dress in her hands. She wanted very badly to go home to Uncle Bill, but she stayed sitting for a while longer, thinking that Lady Claudine might change her mind and come back. As the sun began to set, Layla realized she was sitting for nothing and decided to go home. She walked down the stairs, touching the skirt of her dress with her hands. Before she left, the maid told her that Miss had given her permission to take the dress for herself and held out a single gold coin. Layla was reluctant to accept this handout, but the maid took her palm in her own and put the coin down herself and told her that she should accept with gratitude what the gentleman gave her it was part of etiquette. She looked at the coin once more, squeezed her palm and went on her way more briskly, telling herself mentally that she did not need to think any more about what had happened. But suddenly she was called by name. It was Claudine, surrounded by her brothers. Layla mentally asked herself how she was able to run into her again. The brothers asked their sister who the girl was. She replied that she was being raised by the gardener. Layla squinted her eyes and thought, could it be considered a relief that at least there was no duke in this situation? Claudine waved her hand and wished Layla a good journey. She bowed and ran as fast as she could. She wanted to get away as fast as possible from this strange, unfamiliar place. But because she was running fast, she stumbled and fell, and the coin fell out of her hands, rolling forward. Layla reached for the coin, but someone came up to her and stepped on it with the toe of a shoe. The girl jerked up and raised her head. In front of her stood the duke. His gaze was cold, he looked so that under this onslaught she felt infinitely insignificant. Duke Gerhardt made Layla realize how insignificant her presence here was. She rose to her feet and lowered her head. At first glance it seemed that one corner of his red lips was raised. Layla's knees were torn and streams of blood ran down her legs. As soon as Layla noticed the Duke's smirk, the pain that had gripped her body miraculously disappeared. The only thing on her mind were the words spoken by M.S. Brant. It was a phrase that deeply hurt Leela, that she was no better than a puppy. The Duke stepped back, and Leela bent down in front of him to pick up the coin. Then she stood up, bowed silently before the Duke, and ran with all her legs again. All the way to the house accompanied the lump stuck in her throat, ready to burst out. It wasn't until she passed the forest path and saw the warm light coming from the house that Leela realized what it was. It was sadness. Uncle Bill was standing on the porch, looking anxiously at the girl. Tears stood in her eyes. Uncle Bill knocked on Layla's room and went inside and asked if she would go to the woods today. Layla replied that she wanted to stay home all day today. He closed the door and thought about the fact that today was the second day Layla sat depressed in her room. 
While the girl sat on her bed, Ramur sat down at the kitchen table and wondered if his house had always been this quiet. Now that Layla was in such a state, he noticed that he had gotten used to the silence. Layla went out of the room and placed a gold coin on the table on top of a square folded handkerchief. She had asked her uncle to accept it. Ramur now understood why the girl had been so glum after her visit to the mansion. After putting down the plates of food he sat down and clarified that this coin was given to her by that young miss. He then asked why she wanted to give the money to him. Layla replied that she realized that it was a large sum of money. She realized that she shouldn't throw money around even if she was upset. That was why she had raised the coin in front of the duke for her uncle's sake. She admitted that no matter how much she pondered, she still thought that such an act seemed bad. However, if she gave the money to her uncle, she thought that just a little, but she could repay his kindness in this way. Uncle Bill grew gloomy. Even from the moment Layla had come home as if trying to escape from trouble, he had realized that she had been confronted with something at the mansion that had caused her great pain. But he pretended not to notice anything because he was afraid of bringing her to tears by questioning her. He clenched his fist and called the aristocrats damn snobs. Then he turned to Layla and said that she had earned the money herself and could keep it. The girl was surprised and asked how she had earned it. Uncle Bill reasoned that for the time spent together with an aristocrat dying of boredom she had rightfully earned the money. It was indeed a thankless job, but Layla had done a great job with it. Therefore she could confidently accept the payment and it would be the right thing to do. Layla still sat there surprised as well, and didn't fully understand her uncle's words. He said it was true and congratulated her on entering the adult world. She took the coin in her hand and told her uncle that she was still a child. Uncle Bill replied that if she could make a living on her own, then she was an adult. Layla said it only happened once and she only got one gold piece. After putting a whole bunch of meat on Layla's plate, Uncle Bill said that there were a whole bunch of adults in this world making ends meet, even after getting old. So she was off to a good start. And since the start was so good, Layla would make a great adult. Then he added that she had been eating quite like a bird the last few days so she should eat more now. He reminded her that he didn't like children who didn't eat well. Chewing on the meat Layla asked if she would grow up if she ate a lot. Uncle Bill responded affirmatively and asked if anyone was calling her little. Layla pouted and said she wasn't, she just looked like a baby. Bill thought that she was a child even though just a few minutes ago he had called her an adult. He got up and went to get a pitcher of apple juice. Walking back to the table, he answered Layla's question to her about whether she could spend the money, that she could buy what she wanted. She said she wanted a new notebook since she had already written all over her previous one. She then asked if she could buy more colored pencils. The uncle replied, as many as you want. Layla asked him if he wanted anything. The man was surprised that the girl wanted to buy something for him too and asked what she would do if he asked for something unthinkably expensive. Layla glowed and cheerfully replied that then she would definitely save up lots and lots of money and buy him the thing. He said with a smile that he would look forward to it, and they clinked mugs of juice. He was glad that Leela was such a sweet and smart kid. Although her bones and build were small, she was cute, so she would be a very pretty girl when she grew up. But suddenly he thought that beauty was poison to a woman in difficult circumstances. If she wandered around not knowing where to go, she would easily get into trouble. Bill became nervous, as he often did when he got himself worked up. He decided he needed to send her to a place that was truly trustworthy. Except there was no such thing. Oh, this rotten world and the damn people. Leela drank all the juice in one gulp and asked for another drink. Then Bill thought that the girl might grow up to be a drinker too. Day after day passed, and Bill kept thinking about the reasons why he couldn't raise Layla. One day she went into the woods, and he waited for her at home. He didn't know what safe place to send the troublemaker who had come into his life. So the girl continued to grow, the newly purchased clothes grew small, her creamy skin bloomed, and the room that looked like a temporary warehouse was transformed into a powder room with a soft air. Still clear in my mind was the image of a child bouncing happily up and down the walkway. It was not long before the realization came that Leela had grown into a beautiful 18-year-old girl. She was picking raspberries in the forest, and when her basket was full, she went home, figuring she would need to pick a few more baskets. She became as beautiful and fresh as the roses Bill tended in the garden. That's how she came to live permanently in Arvis, next to Bill Remur. 
Leela brought the basket to the house and told her uncle to take a look. The uncle was surprised, and the girl said that this year's harvest was huge, and tomorrow she wanted to pick more to make raspberry jam. She also picked some peaches and treated Ramur to them. They sat in the chairs on the veranda and began to eat the peaches. Another summer was coming. When evening came, Layla was sitting at the table in her room doing her homework and other things. There was an exam coming up the school year was coming to an end. Reading diligently by candlelight had made Layla's already poor eyesight even worse. She decided that if possible she should buy glasses soon. So she decided to pick more raspberries in the forest of Arvis, sell all the jam, and use the money to buy the long-awaited purchase. At first she thought that 20 jars would be enough, but then she realized that 30 would be better and came to the conclusion that she intended to pick absolutely all the raspberries in the forest. Uncle Bill came into the room and told the girl not to go to bed so late. She said she would study a little longer and go to bed, and wished him good night. He went off to his room smiling. When he decided to put Layla in school everyone was against it. They thought it was an unnecessary hassle, considering Bill wasn't going to keep her. After all, even if she stayed, she would either have to marry and go to live in another good house or get a job with the Duke as a servant, in which case much school knowledge is not particularly necessary. But despite the criticism of others in the mansion, Rimmer still escorted the girl to school. She was very happy to learn new things at school she could feed her curiosity, and in the evening she would tell Uncle Bill what new things she had learned. She was a good student, and he regularly, with an approving tone, said that she would make a great adult. It was as if those words had become a mantra and a spell for Leela. She tried her best to live up to Uncle Bill's expectations and repay him by becoming a great adult. Then Leila thought about the fact that she would soon be going on vacation for the summer break, and then she remembered that this was the year the Duke would be coming. After graduating from the university he had, according to his family's tradition, enrolled in the Royal Military Academy. The reason why the Duke hadn't appeared in Arvis since the summer of two years ago was because he had been sent to serve on the front lines. Now that he had finished his service, he was returning to the mansion. Layla was not happy, for now she would have to hear gunshots in the woods again. The next day, after class at Gillis Girls School, Layla was walking with her friends. They were chatting about how they would spend their summer vacation. The girl replied to her friends that she hadn't decided yet, but there was time ahead to figure out how to spend the vacation. A young man with blonde hair stood in front of them, he called out to Leela and waved his hand. The other girls regarded him and he shrank awkwardly against the hedge. Her friends told Leela that this guy had come to see her again. Leela, because of her poor eyesight, frowned, and yet she could still get a good look at the young man. It was Kyle. Leela told the girls that she would see them later and ran to her friend. They started giggling and whispering about their friend's suitor. Walking up to Kyle, Layla told him that he didn't need to wait for her here, he could have just come to her house. The young man replied that he was on his way anyway. Even though he said that, he actually skipped practice at the tennis club to walk home with Layla from school. Meanwhile, at the tennis club, he was being cursed for choosing to run to a girl's house instead of practicing. It wouldn't be surprising if he ended up getting expelled because of such shenanigans. Kyle said he was hot, and offered Layla her favorite ice cream to eat on the way. The girl agreed and they bought a cone each. Kyle thought that during this precious time when he could be with Layla, he just didn't see the point of going to tennis. The girl soiled herself and he pointed to her cheek, whereupon she wiped herself with a handkerchief and they continued on their way. He admired her, thinking that the problems at the club could be left for tomorrow. They stopped at a bookstore. Layla wanted to buy an illustrated bird guide. She said the migratory birds were coming back. That's what she wanted to research which birds were coming to them, over the summer vacation. Kyle said Layla had a great love of birds. As he looked at her bent over her books, Kyle wondered if today was the day he should confess that he was in love with her. Feeling the stare, Layla looked at Kyle and asked if he wanted to say something to her. Kyle blushed and looked away, saying he was just thinking. He then asked if she had decided on a book, and would she be looking at others? Layla said she would buy that particular one and they went home. Kyle thought it was too soon to admit his feelings after all. He didn't want to confess early, not knowing how Layla felt, and bring discomfort to their friendship that had been maintained so far. Sure, he became intemperate when he saw Layla transforming from day to day. But one would have to be more patient to keep seeing that smile. 
And honestly, Kyle thought, it didn't have to start with lovers. They'd known each other for a long time, so wasn't it better to be spouses right away? Spouses who as they were now were more comfortable with each other than with anyone else. His spouses who loved each other. This was what he pondered as Leela told him about her difficulties in geometry. He wondered if they should get married right after graduation. He closed his eyes and imagined what Leela would look like in her wedding dress. Surely there wouldn't be a more beautiful bride in this world than Leela. Kyle Etman's wife Layla Edman. Just thinking about it made his smile stretch to his ears and his face completely redden with embarrassment. Layla looked at Kyle and asked why he was laughing and covering his mouth with his hand. She then immediately said that he was apparently made fun of by the fact that she had done poorly on her geometry exam. Kyle ran after Layla, who began to speed up, and began to explain that that wasn't what he was laughing about. She got on her bike and told him that he had good grades in geometry, so naturally he didn't understand her. Kyle caught up with his friend and held onto the end of the bike. As they approached the house, the young man asked if Layla had heard the news that Duke Gerhardt was returning to the estate this summer. Layla lied that she hadn't known about it. Kyle said that it seemed like lately the people of the manor had been on their ears about the fact that he was coming back soon. Why didn't Layla care about that at all? The girl remained silent, but mentally answered that after the day she had lifted the coin near the Duke's feet, she never wanted to see him. It was Lady Claudine who had called her to the manor then, neglected her, and then given her the coin as if it were alms. However, the man who made her feel insignificant was the Duke. This left a different scar on Leela, different from the scorn and oppression she had endured as a child wandering from relative to relative. Every time she saw the Duke, memories of that day flashed through Leila's mind. So she tried her best not to cross paths with him. And even in those moments when they rarely met, Leila purposely bowed her head as low as possible. So she couldn't see his face. She hated the Duke. The one who reminded her of events and wounds she wanted to forget. Suddenly, Kyle asked the girl if he should become an officer. Imagining a rifle in his hands, Kyle said he would become an officer like Duke Gerhardt and get an order. A sniper putting a bullet into the heart of the enemy with a 100% hit Captain Etman. Isn't that a perfect target? Layla asked her friend had he managed to forget. After all, he couldn't even kill a single chicken. Kyle countered by asking why she was bringing that up. One day last year, Uncle Bill had been in a bad mood, yelling at Kyle, calling him by his first and last name, asking why he kept hanging around their house, forgetting his own. Besides, the young gentleman from a rich family even ate at their house instead of his own. And he ate a lot. Grabbing the eating boy, Remer said that this would not work and from now on the little boy of the Etman family would not be allowed to enter his house. Kyle was scared. Those were the only times he could be around Layla. He was visiting them, using his studies as an excuse. He excitedly yelled to his uncle that he would pay for all the food he ate at their place. Or would do anything he told him to do. Uncle Bill accepted this answer and gave Kyle the task of catching food for dinner. He sent him to the chicken coop and ordered him to catch a chicken and kill it so he could make dinner out of it afterward. But it turned out that the chicken itself kicked Kyle's ass and he cowered in a corner. Uncle Bill said with a stern look on his face that the boy couldn't even catch one chicken and called him the useless glutton of the Etman family. Kyle was upset then and could barely hold back tears. The words about being a useless glutton stuck deep in his heart and Layla had to comfort him afterward. Leela could barely contain her laughter as she recalled the story, and Kyle pouted and said that since then Uncle Bill had never called him by his first name and had only addressed him as Glutton. Layla patted him on the shoulder and called him a cute Glutton. The young man asked his friend why she was making fun of him. She replied that she liked him precisely because of the way he was and continued laughing. She then said that she hoped his hands would be saving people instead of shooting guns. She asked him if he didn't think it would be much better himself. Kyle blushed and said that of course he would become a doctor, follow in his father's footsteps. But along the way, he wondered if he should become a military doctor. Do military doctors get orders too? Layla said that surely they do, because saving people is a great thing. Suddenly, an automobile passed by them. Inside sat Count Gerhardt in his military uniform. Layla and Kyle couldn't see who was sitting inside. The young man assumed it was an old lady. Layla said that Madame didn't like automobiles, so it was unlikely that it was her. Kyle asked why. Because a car combines a geometrically beautiful model with technology. 
Layla was not thrilled that her friend mentioned geometry again. At this point, Kyle remembered that he was supposed to show her the notebook he had brought with him, but found that he had forgotten to put it in his briefcase after all. Layla moved on and said that he could go home to get the notebook and then he could come over for dinner. Kyle followed, asking if she wanted to meet him or the notebook. Ta replied that it was obvious that she wanted the notebook. It was just an act and Kyle realized that the girl wasn't being serious. He said he was upset, even though he wasn't, and added that he'd run home quickly and come back. Leela shouted to him that he could take his time, since it would take time to make dinner anyway. Layla got back on her bike and began to ride on, taking her time, thinking about what to make for dinner tonight. Duke Gerhardt told Hesse, his butler, to have the driver stop the car. The man was surprised that he wanted to stop here. The Duke replied that he wanted to walk. All three of them got out of the automobile. Hesse told the Duke that they would wait for him nearby. He replied that there was no need for that, and that he would walk directly to the manor. Hesse was very worried, sweat was running down his face. Since the Duke had arrived a week earlier than planned, the servants had barely managed to prepare everything, and now he suddenly decided to walk alone. Before Hesse could say anything else, the Duke sternly said that they would see each other at the manor. He took off his cap and started walking through the woods. The Duke covered his eyes and began to breathe in the clean air. He remembered his mother telling him that he should get engaged this summer. He had agreed to it, for to marry at the right time and to bear an heir was his one main duty. His grandmother had said then that Claudine was the most suitable lady to take the place of a duchess. Matthias also accepted his grandmother's advice as well. Claudine von Brandt had a fine pedigree and had all the qualities befitting a good bride. His mother told him that same evening that she would arrange the entire meeting when he returned from his service to create an engagement. That's life. Even if you don't want something, even if you don't crave it, everything is already prepared in the best way. The perfect life. Sometimes it's so natural that it gets boring. In this life he was the perfect child, the perfect student, and became the perfect officer. And now he's going to marry the perfect woman and become the perfect father so that, as head of the duchy, he can make his family stronger. That's what his father and grandfather did, and that's what he will do. Layla rode past Matthias on her bicycle. As she rode a little farther away, she turned around and their gazes met. Realizing who was standing next to her in just one second, she stopped riding, but she didn't slow down gently in time and fell to the ground. The duke looked at the golden hair and immediately realized that this girl was the child from the gardener's house the one who ran around the forest all day burying birds. He was a little surprised that she still lived on the estate. She rose from her knees and with her head down asked the duke for forgiveness. She then noticed that her textbooks had fallen out of her bag onto the ground and began to pick them up. Matthias continued to stand still and regard her, and then called her by her first and last name. The girl apologized to him again without raising her head. She wanted to grab the pen, but the moment she grasped it, the duke stepped his boot on the other end of the pen, preventing her from lifting it. Layla tried to pull it out, but to no avail. Then the duke said he was calling for her, Layla Livlin. Eventually the girl lifted her head and said she was listening to him, he could talk. But he answered nothing, and only grinned and took a step back, releasing his pen, and walked past. Layla clenched her hand indignantly, she was annoyed that he didn't end up saying anything to her. She turned in his direction and bit her lower lip to contain her anger. If the people praising the duke knew that he, being a perfect aristocrat, did such stupid things. Gathering all her things and picking up her bicycle Layla, holding back the pain from the wound on her leg from the fall, began to walk slowly behind the duke she had no right to overtake him. Was he really going to walk so slowly all the way home? Better to use his long legs for their intended purpose and walk faster. Suddenly, the duke stopped and Layla stopped as well. He turned around and looked at her. The thought came to him that time was passing, and with it the child was growing up, Layla was no longer a girl, she had become a grown-up girl. As summer comes to a close and Duke Gerhard arrives at the mansion, the servants have to work harder than usual to prepare for the many guests who visit the mansion when the Duke returns. All in preparation for the many guests visiting the mansion when the Duke returns. For various soirees, gatherings and other important events, the hard work of the servants must lead to an increase in the dignity of their masters. The Count Brandt family is the second most prestigious noble family in Burko, after the Gerhardt family, 
they were some of the guests who were to be treated with special consideration. They arrived at the mansion, the Duke, along with his mother, greeted them as they got out of the car. The nominal reason for the Brandt family's visit was to visit relatives to celebrate the beginning of summer. However, everyone already knew that the Count's only daughter, Claudine von Brandt, had come to Arvis for more than just that reason. Matthias gave her his hand as she stepped out of their car. Before announcing an engagement, the two families would hold preliminary talks and the interested parties would hold a friendly meeting. Their purpose was clear, and neither family made any attempt to hide the fact. Especially Claudine. Baton Shistiemen. Placing her cup of tea on the table, the young lady said that no matter how many times she saw it, the greenhouse always looked simply magnificent, Madame Gerhardt, as if she had moved a whole paradise here. Matthias' mother replied that the greenhouse had been meticulously cared for and she was looking forward to handing the greenhouse over to a mistress who knew its value. Everyone in the audience understood these hints perfectly. Then, Madame Gerhardt turned to her son and offered to give him a tour of Arvis Paradise for Claudine while they continued their business conversations at the table. Matthias stood up unhesitatingly and offered his hand to Claudine. As he held her hand in a lace glove, the image of a hand stained with blood and earth, reaching for a stationary pen, immediately surfaced in the young man's mind. He himself didn't realize why the image of Leila had popped up in his mind, and he immediately dispelled those thoughts. Now that Claudine was a perfect lady, there was no shadow of a younger sister in her, inferior to her brothers. And Matthias, accompanying her, behaved as formally as if he had met her for the first time. There was nothing surprising about it, but Claudine's parents were very touched watching the couple. Especially her mother, who was always worried about her daughter's manners. Madame Gerhardt believed that even if they weren't very close, they still knew each other for a long time. Therefore, they realized that each of them, Matthias von Gerhardt and Claudine von Brandt, were aristocrats to the core. That was therefore the main and primary reason for this particular marriage they were perfectly suited to each other for a marriage of convenience, and had chosen each other for it. Walking around the greenhouse, Claudine said that the birds that lived there were truly amazing and got along so well with people. One of the birds sat on her arm, unafraid of danger. She wondered what the secret was, and Matthias asked the servant to explain. The man came over and said that they clipped the bird's wings. Then Claudine asked if it hurt the birds. The man said no, as they only trimmed the feathers at the tips and asked in return if he could demonstrate the process. Claudine clarified with Matthias if he was okay with that. He replied that they could do as they wished. The man took a yellow bird out of the cage. The duke asked what kind of bird was it. The servant replied that it was a canary, these birds sing very beautifully. Then he put it on the table, and spreading the wing, began to cut off the edges with scissors. He said that though the bird was not yet accustomed to human hands and was very wary, if the ends of both wings were cut off it would not be able to fly far away, nor would it be able to leave its master, and so its temper would become docile. Claudine asked if it was necessary to cut them off. The servant said that birds that can fly freely are not easy for humans to tame. Rather, it was even good for them, as it would help prevent them from flying off to a dangerous place, getting lost or injured. When the procedure was finished, the man let the canary go hopping around the table. It tried to take off, but it failed. The bird could not understand what had happened to it. Matthias very sharply grabbed the bird in his palm and squeezed it. The servant excitedly took it from the hands of the master and said that it could not be tamed at once, it needed time to get used to a man, and it would only get frightened. He then offered Miss Claudine to try to tame her, but she, having seen enough information for herself, said she was no longer interested, and thanked him for satisfying her curiosity. She gave the duke her hand and motioned for him to return to the table. He took her palm in his, and the memory of Layla's hand holding the pen came back into his mind. As he left, he turned to the servant and ordered him to take the canary to his bedroom. The servant didn't understand at first, and the duke explained that he wanted the bird to be his personal canary. Gathering raspberries in the woods, Layla pondered about what she had learned at the mansion. Earlier, she had brought a few baskets of flowers there, and the maids, thanking her, immediately started arranging them in vases. Then, the girl asked one of the chambermaids what they were preparing for. Was someone coming to the estate? The maid replied that the family of Count Brandt was coming to visit. Layla thought that perhaps this summer Miss Claudine would visit them once again. In previous years, a duke had visited their residence so it made sense that now it was her turn. 
The maid leaned in towards the girl and whispered that it seemed the Duke and Lady Brandt were going to get engaged. Layla was curious to know who would become the beautiful bride who would marry their Duke. It seemed that Lady Brandt's annual visits to the estate were bearing fruit. And now, as she gathered raspberries and looked at the mansion in the distance, Layla pondered. Now she understood why it had been so quiet after the Duke's arrival, as all the staff diligently prepared for the important event. Wiping her face from sweat, as the summer was hot, the girl decided that today she needed to finish all her tasks. Before the Duke takes over the woods, and before Miss Claudine starts calling her, when she feels like it. The Duke arrived at the outhouse. His subordinate informed him that everything inside was ready and warned him that in the second half of the day, the gentleman would have a meeting with the directors. So he would prepare the car by noon and ask the Duke to be ready by that time and not forget about the meeting. Matthias nodded and went into the outhouse. It was a place with a beautiful view of the Schurter River and the Arvis Forest. Matthias liked the landscapes here, so he converted Elling into the outhouse. His grandmother and mother rarely walked along the riverbank, so the lodge became his own world, his personal fortress where no one else entered. The Duke took off his jacket, walked into the living room, and looked out the window. Today was a sunny day. Through the large windows and glass doors, the entire space was brightly lit. When he didn't have a schedule to follow, Matthias would relax and enjoy the views of the forest and river right here at the outhouse. He would read books or take a nap if reading got boring. The outhouse was a place where he felt comfortable no matter what he was doing, and he especially loved the moment when he surrendered himself to the river. He changed into a light robe, walked to the shore, took off the robe, and gracefully jumped into the water completely naked. No one ever came to this place, and no one could see him, so he could do as he pleased. As he resurfaced after diving, he laid on his back and gazed at the greenery of the trees blocking the sky. The barely noticeable blueness of the sky peeping through the leaves, their rustling in the wind, the birds singing it calmed the floating duke, and as he relaxed, he closed his eyes. After a few days of engagement-related hustle and bustle, it felt like he was dissolving into the peace of the quiet river. Negotiations regarding the marriage relationship between the Gerhardt and Brandt families went smoothly, as expected. The engagement period was set for one year. By the end of this summer, the engagement would be officially announced to the world. The family and other people of the upper and middle classes believed that Matthias had already earned enough honor as the Duke of Gerhardt so there was no need to remain in the officer position for long. Serving a year or two in the Royal Guard, he planned to focus on the family business after demobilization following the wedding. As always, his life flowed like a serene river. Just as he had planned. Layla, eating a peach on a tree branch and reading newspapers, suddenly froze. A leaf fell from her hand and fluttered down. The Duke noticed this in his peripheral vision and turned to discover the girl in the tree. Layla, who had poor eyesight, kept squinting. At first, she thought it was a floating log, then she was able to discern that it was a person, completely naked. And only when she fully saw him did she realize it was the Duke of Gerhardt. She immediately covered her face with her hands and shut her eyes. Matthias swam towards Layla, and in a panic, she started screaming at him not to come closer. She hastily jumped off the tree and ran away into the woods towards her uncle's house. She was all red with embarrassment and afraid of the Duke's retribution. What could he do if he reached her? Kyle came to the house. He greeted his friend and said he was just looking for her, and the uncle replied that she was picking raspberries. The girl ran so fast that she bumped into Kyle with her forehead. The boy held her shoulders and asked if everything was okay. It seemed like she was frightened by something and running away from someone. Layla couldn't catch her breath to reply, so the boy asked again if she had encountered a wild animal. The image of the swimming duke appeared before the girl's eyes again, she blushed once more, and with a doomed voice, she said it would have been better if it were a wild animal. Kyle shook her by the shoulders and asked her to come to her senses. Her face looked as if she had seen a ghost, but the girl said it was something even scarier. Kyle reminded her that she was picking raspberries and they needed to return. He didn't know why she was acting this way but they definitely had to go back into the woods. Layla firmly replied that she would never go back to the woods, simply because she didn't want to. Then she turned around and walked back into the house. Two baskets filled with berries, a straw hat, and newspaper sheets continued to lie under the very same tree where Layla had been sitting earlier. The Duke climbed out of the river, put on his pants and shirt, and approached that spot. 
He leaned over the baskets, wondering if Layla had decided to destroy all the raspberries in the Arvis forest. Matthias lifted his head and looked at the tree branches where bright sunlight was falling. Immediately, the moment of their first meeting flashed before him. Layla had been sitting on a tree just like that, begging not to shoot her. The Duke smiled to himself, unable to believe that she was still frolicking around climbing trees. Layla went to the store to finally buy glasses. She tried on the offered frames and the salesman asked her how she saw. The girl replied that she felt as if she had entered a new world. The man then asked the girl to read the fine print in the book to make sure what was the worst she saw. Layla said that in normal life she could see everything quite well, and her eyes strained only when reading, but thanks to the glasses she could read with ease. When she left the shop she was very pleased with herself, because she was able to buy an expensive and necessary purchase with the money she had earned by her own labor. It was not for nothing that she had spent days picking raspberries and making so much jam. However, obscene thoughts of the Duke did not leave her head. Trying not to think about it, she was about to walk through the city to meet Kyle later, but suddenly, a woman's voice called her name. Leela turned around and saw Duke Gerhard and M.S. Claudine in front of her. The aristocrat remarked that Leela had grown into a proper lady in the time they hadn't seen each other, and also said that she almost didn't recognize Leela because of her glasses. She called her over to her place and suggested that they sit together in a cafe and have tea. Layla knew she couldn't refuse, so she followed M.S. Claudine, thinking to herself, why did she call her to her room? She hoped it wouldn't take too long and Kyle wouldn't have to wait for her. They sat down at the table, and Layla felt uncomfortable being so close to the Duke. When she was a little girl, she had had the immature thought that when she met his blue eyes, she would hear a clear ringing. Now, however, she felt very uncomfortable. She blushed, and thought of the fact that she had hoped very much that she would succeed in avoiding the Duke, and they would not cross paths again. But alas, it had not worked out. But why was it only her who felt uncomfortable? Why wasn't the Duke completely ashamed of what had happened that day? Normally, a person who appeared in an unsightly manner should be embarrassed. Perhaps it was because the Duke, like all other aristocrats, saw servants as furniture, and it was strange to be ashamed of furniture. Therefore, he did not care for Leela. Then the girl decided that she would liken herself to this very furniture and would sit, merged with the chair, as quietly and inconspicuously as possible. At that moment, MS, Claudine asked her if she liked school. It seemed she was graduating next year. Layla confirmed that was the case and said she was in a class that was training future teachers. The Count's daughter praised the girl and said that she had a very good goal and the profession suited her, and then asked Matthias if he agreed with her. The Duke turned towards Layla and looked at her intently, causing the girl to look down. Afterward, the two of them began to discuss who they should invite to the upcoming event, and Layla just sat silently. After a few minutes, she interrupted the gentleman and asked them to let her be rude and leave first, as it was nearing the time of her appointment with her friend. M.S. Claudine let the girl go, she bowed, wished them a good day, and ran off. Matthias noticed that Layla had never touched her teacup. And now the girl was already sitting on a bench in town with Kyle, eating a sandwich. He congratulated his friend on the upgrade and praised that she really worked hard. Afterward, he joked that if the glasses are moved off her nose a little, her eyes become quite tiny. Layla asked not to be bullied and they continued eating, remembering to drink water from the bottle. The Duke and M.S. Claudine were on their way back by car, but the carriage caused a traffic jam ahead. As they stood on the road, Matthias saw through the window that Leela, who had not touched her cup of tea before, was eating a sandwich with her friend with great appetite. In him, he recognized at once the son of their attending physician. It made him uncomfortable to think that this girl was sitting so quietly in front of him, lowering her gaze, just waiting for the moment to leave for someone she really wanted to spend time with. And that person wasn't him. She'd left him, for this guy. The image of Layla on her bike in the woods when they'd first met this summer wouldn't go away in his mind. And his eyes couldn't take his eyes off the girl laughing at the moment. She was having fun with Kyle, not uncomfortable at all. Countess Brandt, Claudine's mother noticed Layla helping Uncle Bill in the yard, standing near the balcony. They were spending the summer at Duke Gerhardt's residence, and young lady Claudine herself, sitting in a chair, was embroidering flowers. The woman was surprised that the girl who had once been sheltered by the gardener still lived on the estate. Claudine told her mother that it was indeed Layla, 
and noted that the girl was getting more and more beautiful as she grew older. The mother asked her daughter worriedly, was she really okay with that? Claudine asked back, could it really bother her? Anyone in her shoes would be worried, but Claudine doesn't think about it and doesn't get worked up about it. Layla was still a beautiful child as a child. However, the Layla that Claudine met after a long time exceeded her expectations. Small body was a feature of Rabita women, they had delicate and beautiful facial features. White clear skin and bright green eyes. That was why Claudine had so suddenly suggested that Layla join them and go to the hotel for tea. She was curious how Sir Gerhardt would react when he saw the beautiful girl who had grown up on his estate. And he certainly met her expectations with moderate interest and indifference, impeccable dignity and restraint. Claudine told her mother that she knew how worried she was, but she didn't want to depend on such a thing. The Countess replied to her daughter that she was still young and didn't know men. Claudine asked if her mother wanted her to get all the beautiful girls in the world out of Sir Gerhardt's sight. She agreed that she was still young and didn't understand men, but she knew that even men of good reputation had one or two mistresses. She didn't deny that perhaps something common would happen and Gerhardt would become interested in Layla, or someone else. He, too, might be seized by passion for a woman, like her father, like so many other men. But a man who knows how to treat a mistress like a normal lover is harmless. The problem is the man who doesn't know how to treat a mistress based on her status and makes an important person out of her. Matthias von Gerhardt was clearly of the first type. He is the head of the family, who will not give up his own for a momentary passion. Then Claudine said that she hoped it would not happen, but if the Duke had a mistress, perhaps it would be more convenient if she was a girl like Layla. After all, she wouldn't dare threaten his position, and Claudine herself would be able to tame her and keep her in her hands. Her mother condemned her daughter for such thoughts. Claudine felt sorry for her mother she suffered from a weak and frail body, and had miscarriages all the time. She had only been able to give birth to Claudine with great effort, and the brothers she had spent time with as a child were apparently cousins. Her mother was worried about not being able to give birth to an heir, and so she was afraid that her father would leave her for, for another woman who could bear him a son. Her mother was as tired as her own daughter's pity for her was great. Countess Brandt continued to be indignant, wondering how she hadn't noticed Leila before in so many years and said she would talk to the Duke's family about it after all. Claudine told her that even if Sir Gerhardt was interested in this beautiful child, what did it matter? After all, even so she could only become his mistress, nothing more, which meant that nothing would threaten their engagement anyway. Her mother had told her daughter that she did not know what love was and had no idea how reckless that feeling could make a person. Claudine thought about that, looking at her mother, who never stopped crying because of that very love, that there was no way she would live like her. She didn't want a love that would be thrown away when it faded, she wanted a perfect marriage that could protect her high position and dignity. Matthias was in his chambers, and was playing with a bird he kept in a cage. It had grown accustomed to him, and now it was sitting on his palm and rubbing its head against his fingers. The Duke looked out of the window and saw Layla there. He drew parallels between the two golden-haired creatures. Kyle arrived at Layla's house but there was no one in the yard or inside the house so he decided to wait on the veranda. He reflected on the fact that lately, by the minute, he was finding it harder and harder to contain his feelings in front of his girlfriend. The other day when they had lunch in town as he always did, he had taken his bicycle with him so that he could feel Layla's grip on him from behind. She'd insisted on treating him to ice cream afterward, and he'd been thrown into a fever by the mere touch of her fingertips against each other as he'd taken the cone from her hands. He even sometimes had dreams that he felt guilty about, and that fever became unbearable. He was very much afraid that there might be a rival to win the girl's heart, and he decided that he must confess to her, so that she might at least know how he felt, before another confessed. At that moment, the girl called his name. Kyle turned around and found that Leela was wearing a large pink hat studded with artificial flowers. The young man, who had taste in clothes, immediately started laughing, pointing his finger at his friend, and through his laughter asked where she had bought such a rustic hat. The girl got angry and said that her uncle had given her that hat. Bill Rimmer stood beside her with a shovel in his hands. Kyle instantly changed his face and said that the hat was very beautiful and sophisticated, it suited Layla very well, and her uncle had great taste. Rimmer ended up hitting the boy on the head, causing a lump to form. Despite this, Kyle was called to the table. Sobbing, he gave thanks that he would be fed after all. 
After dinner, Layla went out onto the veranda and sat in a chair, reading a book. She placed a saucer of cookies and tea next to her as a snack after a hearty lunch. Kyle approached her and asked if she was still angry. The girl, without turning around, dryly answered yes. Kyle began to shake his friend by the shoulder and begged her to forgive him. He then asked why her uncle had bought her a hat. Leela replied that she had asked her uncle for it herself. Kyle was surprised and the girl explained that when she had shown Ramur the glasses he had been upset. He had never been mad at Leela, but this time he was very unhappy that his adopted daughter hadn't told him about her poor eyesight. Leela had told him then that she didn't want him to worry. She had been sitting on his neck for so many years, so she wanted to at least buy glasses with the money she had earned. For a few more days Uncle Bill was angry with her and Layla felt uncomfortable. Then she approached him and asked him to buy her a hat. Bill went alone to the women's store and picked it out so it was a very meaningful act and gift to Layla. Since her uncle was a gardener he thought flowers were the most beautiful, so he chose this hat. Layla herself thought it was the prettiest too, until someone called it rustic. Kyle apologized again. Bill Rimmer left the house, unhappy that Gluttony was still their guest, and told Layla that he was going into town and would be back soon. As they talked, Kyle thought about the fact that Uncle Bill would always come first among men. The thought even made him envious. Afterward, they sat down to their books again. Kyle wanted someone to look at him, and he regretted bringing his friend a detective. She didn't look away from the book at all, absorbed in the story. He moved his book away from her face and watched Layla eat her cookies. She was adorable. He had already decided that this was the moment for confession when suddenly, the Duke rode up to the gardener's house on horseback, accompanied by his entourage. Kyle and Layla immediately jumped up in their seats, and the girl began to panic, shaking her mouth off the crumbs and chewing the rest of the cookies as fast as she could. Her friend told her that she had long since shaken it all off and could calm down. Duke asked her where Bill Rimmer was. Leela replied that he was out of town and asked if there was anything urgent that needed to be done. The Duke ordered her, as the gardener's daughter, to cut flowers in the garden and bring them to his outhouse, and then galloped away. The girl put on a new hat and took a basket to go to the garden. Kyle said he wanted to help her but Leela refused, replying that there was nothing difficult about it. She asked Kyle to go home or his mother misses. Etman would once again scold him for not studying enough and only spending time with her. Kyle obediently stopped and thought, wasn't it strange that the Duke himself drove up to Layla's house and asked for flowers? He was probably on his way and that explained everything but somehow the young man still felt uneasy. Layla brought a basket with all kinds of flowers but the Duke said that he did not like such a motley and ordered to bring new flowers which shades would be in the same color. Layla went to the garden to get more flowers. She didn't know much about the estate but she knew that the outhouse was the Duke's territory. No guests came there and not even all the servants were allowed to come, only a narrow circle of people. Accordingly, she decided that since he had asked for flowers, they were for Miss Claudine, to whom they were to be engaged. And knowing her tastes, Layla had specially gathered a few roses of various colors, and bright ones at that. But what a result! With anger she kicked at the stone and told herself to let everyone exalt the Duke, but she knew that in fact he was nasty since he had sent her to do her idle work in this heat. When she returned back with a basket full of soft pink roses, the Duke's business assistant and his companion came out of the annex. They filled out all the necessary paperwork and contracts, and were on their way back to the manor. On the way, they wished Leela good luck. As she entered the outhouse, she realized that there was no one else in the house besides the Duke. So now they were alone together, she was getting uneasy. She went into the room and saw that the Duke was lying in a chair with his eyes closed. He seemed to be dozing. It was unusual to see him so relaxed, with his tie and jacket off, wearing only a shirt with the top buttons undone. Layla didn't know what to do, wait for him to wake up or put the basket on the table and leave. At that moment the Duke opened his eyes. The girl showed him the basket and asked if she should go get the flowers again. The Duke asked if she would do so if he ordered her to. Layla replied that if she made a mistake she would, but it would be better if he told her right away what color he wanted. Realizing what she had just said, the girl lowered her head so her face couldn't be seen behind her hat. How could she have said that, overheated in the sun? But the duke let it pass his ears and told the girl that she should put the flowers in a vase. Layla said she wasn't good at making bouquets and then the man asked her, 
did he really have to do it himself? Leela realized that, given that there were only the two of them in the annex, the Duke had shown her what her responsibilities were. She filled the vase with water and arranged the bouquet. The Duke watched her furtively and thought she was very much like his golden canary. At first it had been very quiet, as if dead, as soon as he had brought it into his bedroom. But then she began to follow him around the room on her own. He wanted to tame another one. Leila placed the bouquet on the table and asked the Duke if he liked it. Matthias replied that she was being very honest when she said she didn't know how to do it. The bouquet was awful. Leila said she would get an experience made, but the Duke stopped her by ordering her to sit down. She obediently sat down and he said she must eat. Layla took the cover off her plate and saw sandwiches and a glass of water. He thought it was a worthy payment. He wanted to repay her on the level of the pleasures the girl loved, for he remembered her eating the same sandwich in the city with her friend and being very happy. He wanted her to be like that around him. Layla said she wouldn't eat since she wasn't hungry, and then Duke asked, did what he said sound like a request? Layla realized that her feelings didn't play a role here, and there was no point in refusing. Maybe it was because she'd already eaten a big meal, and even had a cookie, or maybe she saw it as punishment for the failed bouquet, but either way, she couldn't get a bite down her throat. It was very hard to chew and swallow and she was sure she could hardly finish it. Suddenly the duke reached out to her and untied the bow under her chin that secured the hat to her head. He then removed the hat and placing the hat on his lap, said that it was customary for such hats to be removed indoors. This was the last straw for the girl. She jumped up, dropping the sandwich on the floor, and asked the duke to give her the hat back. He replied that he would give it back to her as soon as she finished everything. Layla said she didn't want to eat anymore, she just couldn't, and asked again for her hat back. Then the duke got up from the couch and said he didn't want to give her the hat back either. The girl kept begging for it, the man raised his hand so she couldn't reach it and ended up throwing the hat out the window. Leela tried to reach out to grab the ribbon to grab the item, but was unable to do so and it fell into the river. Leila ran to the balcony, saw that the hat was in the water and ran to the dock. There, despite her fear of the water, after the incident when her cousins threw her into the water, she decided to go after the hat. She couldn't just leave her uncle's gift behind. He was so happy when he gave her that hat. He opened the box in front of her and told her that if she didn't like it, she could change it at the store. Layla answered him that the hat was just beautiful, and she would even feel sorry to wear it, and her uncle brightened it with the most joyful smile. Layla took off her glasses and laid them carefully on a handkerchief on the wharf, and then went down into the water. The duke followed her, amazed that she had made so much noise instead of doing such a simple task. She would just have to eat, after which she would get her hat and return home. Was it really that difficult? He knew that near the shore the depth was shallow, but a little farther out the bottom was already precipitous and became higher than Layla's height. The girl managed to reach the hat and grasp the tip of the ribbon, but then the sandy bottom disappeared under her feet, and she, not knowing how to swim, began to choke and go to the bottom. But even so she did not let go of the hat, clutching at it with a dead grip. The duke, seeing that Layla had already gone down, sped up and jumped into the river. He grabbed her by the waist and swam up. Matthias climbed onto the dock with Leila. She was lying with her hat pressed to her chest. He sat down tiredly, and the girl began to raise herself on her elbows to cough up the water that had gotten into her lungs. Matthias thought it was simply unthinkable that even after nearly dying, Leila continued to cling tightly to that hat. What was it about her? He couldn't stand it, and began to laugh at the absurdity of the situation. Layla gave him a very angry and embittered look and clenched her teeth. Clenching her fists, she thought to herself, how could he do such a thing and laugh now? She abruptly got to her feet, and with all her appearance showed how angry she was. The duke looked at her, smiling. This was all his fault. She irritably began brushing the water off her hat, frustrated that all the jewelry was now wet through. She was so afraid of ruining this hat. The splash from the hat hit Matthias' face, and he squeezed his eyes shut. Leela was startled at first, and then she spitballed even more spray in his direction. Who cared, they were damp anyway. After the hat, she started wringing out her skirt, still also directing the drops towards the duke. He wiped his face and asked the girl if she was having fun, and then added that he wasn't having fun at all anymore. 
Lila thought she couldn't be having fun at all, but she asked the Duke aloud why he was doing this to her. Matthias said that first she should thank the one who saved her life, and after that she should ask anything. Layla was shocked at how the Duke could turn things around. She said that she didn't think this would have happened if he hadn't thrown her hat out the window. Duke stood up and said that wasn't true. Something like this wouldn't have happened if she had obediently eaten the sandwich and gone home. Layla involuntarily glared at the Duke, whose suit fit even tighter because of the water, and lowered her gaze in embarrassment. He corrected his cuffs and began splashing water from his hands into Layla's face, snapping his fingers. He then said that such a thing also would not have happened if she had not done such a pathetic act of jumping into the water without knowing how to swim. Layla felt a sense of injustice and resentment about to be ready to burst from her lips, but one must be patient. No matter what, the Duke is the master of Arvis, and she can't have Uncle Bill in trouble because of her actions. She bit her lip, then bowed and thanked the Duke for saving her. Matthias said she should apologize again, as a lady should. An angry Layla said that she was not at all the kind of lady one would find in the Duke's circles. He told her that nevertheless, next to him, she should be just that. He straightened up and added that he was a gentleman beside her, as he had always been. Layla reabsorbed her resentment, tied her wet hat, and bowed to the Duke. The bow caused a whole stream of water to pour down from the hat. The girl thanked the Duke for saving her, walked past him, and ran home. Tears immediately formed in her eyes like the day she was given a gold coin, but she forbade herself to cry. Not because of him. She vowed to herself that she would never again be a toy in this man's hands. Escaping the gaze of eyes as blue and cold as river water, Leela ran toward the house. Her eyes were so red that even the shade of her hat couldn't hide them. Hating it, Leela increased her speed even more. One day she saw the Duke strolling along the forest path with Miss Claudine. The image of an elegant gentleman accompanying a beautiful lady was like a picture from a fairy tale. Leela herself, without noticing it, stopped and began to admire him. When they reached the end of the path, the wind blew and Miss Claudine's hat flew away. Then the Duke slowly approached the tree where it had rolled away, picked it up, and returned it to Claudine. That leisurely gesture was very beautiful. And today he had humiliated Layla with the same beautiful gesture as the day before. The girl could not help herself and pressed herself against the trunk of the tree, still gave vent to tears. In front of the Duke Layla felt infinitely pathetic. And for some reason this fact, which was not surprising, scratched her heart even harder today. Layla wiped her face of tears, washed her face with water from the river, and lay down under a tree to calm down. Then she walked back to the house. Anger came over her again and she kicked the fruit on the ground with all her might. As it rolled, Layla realized she couldn't focus on it, it was blurry. She froze and wondered where her glasses were. At this point, the road back seemed especially long. Matthias returned to the outhouse and changed into a house robe. He turned on the gramophone and sat down in the armchair, enjoying the music. Then he looked at Leila's glasses, which he had picked up on the dock. As evening approached, the wind blowing in the outhouse became cooler. The late summer day was dull and quiet. As he continued to listen to the music from the gramophone, Matthias considered his glasses, and seeing what the space looked like through the panes he realized how bad Layla's eyesight was. Was that why her face seemed to be frowning all the time? The image of a child watching her frown, peering out from behind the trees, surfaced in the man's mind. A frazzled and unassuming child, but with unusually sparkling eyes. The Duke took a cigarette, lit it with his lighter, and lit it, occasionally tossing his glasses in the air and catching them back. The child, who was supposed to stay in Arvis territory, only for a short while had grown up imperceptibly in his world, and had become an attractive girl. He remembered Layla running up to the balcony, trying to catch his hat, and then, looking at him angrily, silently jogging past to the exit. Her green eyes sparkled, and he could smell a refreshing and sweet scent coming from her. The scent of a rose, a flower that filled a summer garden. The Duke froze with his glasses and cigarette in his hands and whispered the name Lila Livelin. A name that was so refreshing in the summer heat, awakening from sleep under the scorching sun and heat. The sound of her first and last name, dominated by the letter L, made the tip of his tongue tickle. He put the glasses he had earlier tossed and caught in the drawer as if he were playing ball. 
And in that instant, thoughts of the girl left him because once again he had to play out his role as the perfect duke and get to work. He took a long shower, dressed in a fancy suit, went out of the outhouse in the evening, and went by car to the planned event, namely the banquet. A completely unremarkable evening like any other. Layla was at this time having dinner with Uncle Bill. Pouring juice into a cup, the man said that apparently the glasses had been dragged away by a crow. They were birds, after all, that went crazy when they saw something shiny and sparkling. He asked the girl if she remembered how one of the crows had stolen her hairpin. Leela replied that she couldn't help but remember, for the hairpin had been a gift from her uncle for one of her birthdays. A green bow with a pebble and pearl beads. She was very protective of the gift and was afraid of losing it, but eventually a bird stole it. That day the girl was very upset. Now they remembered it with laughter. The uncle recalled that in that situation the girl had started to look at every nest in the forest, but in the end she never found one. Clinking mugs of apple juice with her uncle, pouting her lips and cheeks, Leila said that if something like that happened one more time, she would fall out of love with those birds. Her uncle said it was no big deal, and they could buy her new glasses. He asked her to be sure to tell him if she never managed to find her frames. She shouldn't have to worry alone. The girl agreed. She lied about the ravens to Uncle Bill, for she thought it best not to mention that the duke had thrown the hat into the river, and because of that she had had to leave the glasses on the wharf. It would only make her uncle uncomfortable. She remembered putting the glasses on top of her handkerchief on the wooden wharf, and was sure that given that people didn't walk in that spot, they should stay in the same place. So she would go there at dawn and get them. But when she arrived at the outhouse in the early morning she saw that the glasses were gone. She examined every inch of the wharf but found no clue. Then she noticed that her handkerchief was wedged in a gap between the boards and the tip was flapping in the wind. The fact that the handkerchief had flown away surely meant that the glasses on top of it had shifted. She looked toward the outhouse and wondered if it was the duke. But she immediately dispelled these suspicions, telling herself that he had no need to do so. Then she looked at the crow sitting on the branch of a tree and wondered if she had stolen her spectacles. Was it her paws that did it? In response, the crow cawed loudly and flew off to do her business. Leela kept shouting at it to return her glasses and show her where she lived. Calming down, Leila told herself that the culprit was one of two things, either it was the crows or the duke. Stubbornly denying the second option, she decided to search the entire forest, as she had done as a child with the hairpin incident. Kyle was sitting in his room in an apartment in the city. A white dove flew up to the open window. Her name was Phoebe, she had been Layla's mailman for two years now. She wasn't afraid of people and was a real glutton. The young man said hello to the bird, and it elegantly turned to him with a leg to which a message was attached. He took the note and handed Phoebe a bowl of millet. She began to peck vigorously. In the note Layla wrote that she had lost her glasses, so she would be looking for them all day today, and would not be able to go to her friend's house in the library as they had planned. Upon learning that his glasses were missing, Kyle immediately jumped up, grabbed his jacket, and started down the stairs to the first floor, toward the exit. Mrs. Etman asked her son where he was going. He lied that he was running to the library to study there. She asked if he was cheating on her, and if he was going to spend time with Layla again. He only replied that she would be at the library too, and ran outside. The woman continued to resent her son for talking about his childhood friend, even though he was at an age when he should be putting all his energy into his studies. Layla was hanging laundry on ropes outside Uncle Bill's house. She heard her name called and was surprised to see Kyle. He rode his bike toward her at full speed. He immediately asked if she'd found her glasses. The girl lowered her head frustratedly and replied that she hadn't found them yet. Kyle said he would buy her new glasses and suggested that she go into town right away. Layla froze then asked why he wanted to buy her glasses. Only then did the guy realize that his feelings were faster than his thoughts. He was willing to buy anything for the one he loved, and he had completely forgotten what kind of person Layla was. She would never take too much, rarely accepted gifts, especially such expensive ones, and strive to always achieve everything on her own, without handouts. The girl thanked her friend for the offer but she could not agree to it. She said that she wanted to find the glasses she had saved so hard for, and she didn't need any others. Kyle had known Layla since she was a little girl so he knew the look she was giving him now. 
the look of the stubborn Layla Livlin who always got what she wanted, no matter what anyone said. Layla, who was used to wearing her hair loose or in a ponytail, had braided it into two braids to keep it out of the way in the fight against the crows. With the help of Kyle who carried a stepladder and supported her from below, she climbed trees and inspected the crows' nests. The boy asked her how she was doing but she said that she couldn't find any points in that nest either. At that moment, a crow flew toward Layla, intent on protecting her home. Kyle shouted to his friend to be more careful, and in the next instant they began to chase the girl away pushing with their paws and pecking at her hands. She immediately began to climb down, apologizing for disturbing them. The next nest had no points either. Leela sketched out a plan in her notebook of where the nests might be and crossed off each one she and Kyle looked at. He walked beside her, carrying the ladder. Just as he'd thought Leela had shown indomitable fortitude. There were black feathers stuck in Leela's hair that she hadn't noticed. Some were sticking out of her hair like they were fox ears and gave her a very cute look. She told Kyle that he didn't have to go with her, he already had to go home and she could handle it from here. The young man refused and stubbornly replied that they had to go together. He immediately covered himself with a blush, as he looked at the cute appearance of the girl. In his thoughts he told Layla, without voicing it out loud, not to even try to dissuade him from helping her, as he was very worried about her. Besides, she was a lot of fun to watch. A car was traveling down the road in the alley. The Duke sat in the back seat, with his secretary and the driver in front. The document assistant asked what were these kids doing here? The driver replied as he heard from the servants that Leela had lost her glasses. She thought a crow had stolen them. Now the girl was searching all the nests in Arvis. In the servants' world, rumors and news passed from word of mouth at a high rate of speed. The Duke, hearing the conversation in the front seats, thought, did Leela really think the crow had done it? I mean, she had left her glasses on the dock. She either didn't understand or didn't want to understand, and the Duke came to think that the second option was still truer. The car began to pass Leela and Kyle, who were walking at a much slower pace. Matthias looked at Leela through the open window, and when he saw her with raven feathers in her hair, he quickly turned away and covered his mouth with his hand, as if embarrassed. Leela, meeting the Duke's gaze, didn't understand why he was looking at her so strangely. She was sure it was not for good. Kyle shouted to his hovering friend, why is she up and not coming? The girl ran after him and told him that the next nest should be close by now. Leela studied and searched the forest so desperately for the sake of clearly identifying a suspect among the two, the crows and the duke, and before going to the second one. They wandered with Kyle for a few more days and examined the nests, and the young man helped with great joy. These futile attempts were praiseworthy, so Matthias pretended that everything was fine. Leila even invented a tool she tied a mirror to a long branch to inspect the nests through the reflection at a distance. And the crows didn't attack her. It was fun enough to rummage through birds' nests and see what curiosities were hidden in them. But as time went on, the silliness of the two of them grew tiresome. Like their own appearance, someone who could hardly find time in his busy schedule to go to the outhouse. The secretary helped the gentleman take off his jacket and told him that the Marquis Linden men would arrive around noon today. The Duke was surprised that Wright would arrive so much earlier than originally planned. The aide replied that Madame had instructed that special attention be given to the preparation of dinner, and if the Duke had nothing to do, she had also asked him to join the dinner. At that moment Matthias noticed through the window that Leila was stomping in place near the outhouse fence. He replied to the secretary that he would do everything and the secretary said that in that case he would leave the car waiting until lunchtime. He wished the duke a good time and left the outhouse. After making sure everyone was gone, Layla walked toward the house. She rang the doorbell and the duke let her inside. Presenting herself before him in the living room, lowering her gaze to the floor, the girl apologized for coming suddenly and making him uncomfortable. She closed her hands in a lock and radiated true politeness and modesty. The Duke thought it quite different from the way she had shucked off her hat and skirt before him. He asked her what was the matter? She replied that she wanted to ask him something. At that moment the telephone rang. Duke got up to take the call. Layla continued to stand still. Listening to the gentleman talk about work stuff, she thought. She wasn't sure, but it seemed to be a complicated conversation about a contract. Even in the annex, Duke Gerhardt continued to work. 
Although the scale of the Gerhardt family was huge, so it was only natural for him to be so busy. Leela looked at him and thought, how with such a busy workload did he always look so relaxed and detached? Even when he smiles his eyes are silent and there is no flaw in his straight posture. And even during a friendly conversation with the person on the other end of the telephone wire, you can feel his strength and elegance as the head of the family overwhelming the other person. No wonder everyone praises him and calls him the flawless Duke Gerhardt. Leela thought that with all these facts, the Duke that everyone admires so much could be the one who took her glasses. No, she began to deny these thoughts, feeling pathetic for even showing up here to ask such a question. She clammed up and told herself in her thoughts that it was a waste to come here and disturb the Duke by pulling her away from her business. She bowed to him and said quietly that she had better go, but Matthias, taking the pipe away from her face and covering it with the palm of his hand so that the interlocutor could not hear, told her to wait. From that one word Layla froze and continued to wait. After the phone call, writing something down on paper, the Duke asked what Layla wanted to ask him. Once again lowering her head and locking her hands, the girl awkwardly said that the day she fell into the water, she had left her glasses on the pier and wanted to know if the Duke had seen them by chance. Matthias replied that he wasn't sure like he'd seen them and like he'd hidden them. Layla immediately asked him glumly, what did it mean that he had hidden them? Had he really hidden them? The Duke walked over to the girl and asked, as she thought to herself, was he capable of such a thing? Layla thought that the Duke was mocking her again. She said she didn't think that was the case. Then Matthias asked why. Layla said that it was a very bad thing to do, and the Duke could not do such a thing. In the evening there was a lavish banquet in the main suite. One of the Duke's friends said that he had never thought that a separate space would be organized for all of them in such a private place. It seems the Duke was quite generous to his bride's requests. Claudine asked Riot if he was already intoxicated considering his speeches. Claudine then said that they didn't even have an engagement ceremony, so she was embarrassed that he kept referring to her as the Duke's fiancé. The other guests said it was true anyway, and in their company it could be kept secret. There was no one in the hall who did not know that it was Claudine who would become the Duchess at these words Riot smiled, and Claudine, turning away angrily, told him that he was drunk after all. She thought it was time for them to disperse, but the guests protested and said they had just sat down and had the whole evening ahead of them. Riot, drinking another glass, apologized to Claudine but even so, he still called her Duchess Gerhardt, which made the apology meaningless. Suddenly he noticed that there was a cage in the room, with a yellow canary sitting inside it. Riot was surprised and asked Matthias, what was this absurd hobby? The canary flew out of the cage and sat on its owner's hand. Everyone in the company simultaneously said ooh greatly surprised. The bird, sensing the gazes of the guests, began to twirl elegantly in front of them. Matthias, stroking the little bird's head with the fingers of his other hand, told Wright that he had decided to raise it. Lindemann didn't understand his friend and asked how exactly he could have a bird. Was he? A cruel bird hunter? It didn't fit in his head. Some of the company suggested that Matthias had decided this time to raise the bird himself, so that afterwards he could let it go into the woods and hunt. And then he burst into laughter. Then they said that this bird was a real poor thing and had no idea what kind of man its owner was. A bird that had entrusted itself to an experienced bird hunter. They didn't even know whether to call it silly or poor, so they decided to ask Claudine. She replied that she thought the bird was both silly and poor. She then clarified that it was the same bird that the Duke had brought from the greenhouse and asked if he had named it yet. If he had not named it yet, she wished to give it a name herself. Matthias replied that there was no need for that and said that the bird would simply be a bird the company continued laughing for a while longer at the silly nameless bird, whose owner was a bird hunter who mercilessly shot them as targets. Layla went to bed but sleep would not come to her. She couldn't let go of the thought that the Duke had hidden her glasses. She fidgeted, trying to sleep, but the picture of today was in front of her eyes. She'd told him that hiding the glasses was a bad thing to do, and then she'd had to work up the courage to blurt out those words. After them, a secretary came into the annex on some urgent business. The Duke immediately switched to him and began to discuss business. The man said that he came to him because of an urgent telegram that needed to be seen right now. Then the Duke nodded to Layla, signaling with that gesture for her to leave. 
she was forced to return home not even being able to ask more questions about the glasses. But now she was certain that it wasn't the crow that had taken the glasses, but the duke. Anger boiled up in her again and she sat up abruptly on her bed, wondering why the duke wanted her glasses. Did he like birds love anything shiny? What was she to do now? She was desperate and pondered how many times she would have to go to him and ask for them back. It was obvious that the duke would not give them back so easily. Since it was night, Layla couldn't scream in anger and only clenched her fists and bit her lips unable to bear it. She couldn't wait indefinitely and began to think of a way to get her glasses back. She paced from side to side around the room, telling herself that on speculation, there was a good chance that the glasses were lying somewhere in the outhouse. He wouldn't take an item found on the wharf into the mansion. And today was the day the Gerhardt family relatives gathered for a dinner party. Everyone including the Duke must be enjoying the party until late at night. This was her chance for her to sneak into the outhouse and find her glasses. Without thinking long and without even changing her clothes so as not to waste any extra time, Layla threw a lace shawl over her shoulders and ran to the outhouse in the night, in just her shirt. She was sure that there would be no adventure, everything would be alright for it was her glasses. The Duke, after leaving the mansion, walking through the Rose Garden, spoke Layla Livelin's name, thinking of the trap he had set for her. It was time to put it to the test. Layla had to know exactly what he meant by the afternoon, and though she was confused, the green eyes that looked at him confidently clearly said so. With the temperament of someone who had spent days searching crow's nests for glasses, she wouldn't give up so easily this time. The duke, having specifically hinted that the glasses were hidden in the outhouse, was waiting for Layla to sneak in, taking advantage of the reason for the dinner that night. Except she didn't know that he would leave the party and be waiting for her in pitch darkness. He lay on the couch, candleless, only illuminated by the rays of the moon, and held Layla's glasses in his hands. He thought about what would he gain by using this bait. There was no answer. However, he wasn't worried. He told himself that he would know the answer once he saw her. The next moment he heard rustling noises not on the first floor. Layla entered the house through the window, wearing only a nightgown. The Duke couldn't see her, but he could hear that she had indeed climbed in through the window though he had left the front door open on purpose to make it easier for her to enter. But this girl was definitely not looking for easy ways in. He smiled, and in his mind told himself that this girl was not outside of his expectations however she always added something unexpected. Layla walked into the main hall, touching the walls and railings with her hands. It was very dark, she could barely see anything. Matthias turned in her direction and watched her actions. He wondered where she would start after how confidently she had climbed in here. She decided to start with the drawers of the nightstands and began to open one by one. But the inspections were fruitless. There were no glasses in any of the drawers. The Duke purposely did not move, lying on the sofa, placing his hand with the glasses directly under the rays of the moon, so that the girl herself would notice him, but she stubbornly did not look in his direction, although he was literally in the middle of the room. He stared at her intently and asked himself, what would he gain by catching her? He now humbly accepted the reason for which he had set this pathetic trap. He turned away, and then asked aloud if this was the thing she was looking for. Layla flinched and turned around, covering her mouth with her hands to keep from shrieking. The only thought in her mind was why is the Duke here? She had definitely heard that there was a banquet at the mansion tonight, so why was he here? But more importantly, how should she behave in this situation? Stammering, Layla began to apologize for coming here. She didn't know he would be here. The Duke stood up and asked, did she really sneak in like a thief? Only now Layla noticed that her glasses were in the man's hand. She adopted a stern look and said that she had come to get back what belonged to her. More specifically the glasses he had hidden. Matthias knew that if Layla was acting so bold, it meant she was scared. She was trembling but continued to speak, leaning her back against the bollards and gripping them with her hands. The Duke silently turned around and walked toward the balcony. Layla was afraid that now he would throw his glasses into the river, as he had earlier thrown his hat, and ran forward, blocking his path. She was afraid that she would never find them again, that they would drown in the river or crash to the ground. She spread her arms apart and told the Duke not to do it. At that moment a wind blew, and a lace handkerchief fell from the girl's shoulders. The moon brightly illuminated her figure, covered only by a single shirt. The Duke froze and gazed at her, 
Leela instantly blushed and bent over to quickly pick up the shawl and cover her bare arms again. Matthias asked Leila if it wasn't funny that she, who had scrutinized his body while he was swimming in the river, was now behaving like this just because of the shirt. Leila had been so afraid that he would ever mention the incident, and here it was. All red, she jumped up and said loudly that she had to, she didn't mean it, it just happened. Then he asked, did he mean to look at her? Leila didn't know what to answer and that made her even more annoyed. She tried to calm herself mentally, assuring herself that she needed to hold back as much as possible right now. The situation was too disadvantageous for her. The Duke could immediately accuse her of stealing and easily throw a thing like the glasses into the river if he wanted to. Anything that was easy for him was ruinous for Layla. The girl bowed politely and said she didn't mean it. Matthias asked her why she was suddenly acting like a lady. She had said she wasn't. Leila tied her handkerchief tightly so it wouldn't fall off her shoulders again and said that whoever she was, he was still a gentleman. At these words, she strained a smile and at this sight, the Duke began to laugh. Afterward, he said that perhaps he wasn't a gentleman at all. Leila worriedly assured him that he was exactly that and no other way. The finest gentleman in Carlsbad. Matthias leaned over to her and said that was a very generous appraisal. Layla said she dared not rate the Duke. Everyone knows the Duke and they probably think the same way. And no other way. Then the Duke asked her perhaps she thought differently? Layla smiled as wide as possible and said she didn't. Layla Livelin this night was selling her soul for glasses. She leaned over and asked the Duke to give her the glasses back and added that they had been bought through hard work and were a very precious thing to her. She apologized for entering the outhouse unauthorized, but she wanted to find them at least that way. The Duke stepped even closer and asked Layla to raise her head. When she did, he put his own glasses over her eyes, tucking her hair behind her ears. His hand traveled down her neck and lingered on her cheek. The Duke looked Layla straight in the eye, his jaw tense. The moon disappeared behind the clouds and they fell into darkness. Matthias touched his thumb to the girl's lower lip and began to drive it, but he didn't dare to do more. Now he understood what the feeling was. He had a passionate desire for Layla Livlin. However, he knew the outcome of this emotion, that this desire would eventually cool down and fade away. In that case, was there a need to tarnish his life just to satisfy this desire? Was Layla Livlin worth it? No, she wasn't. The Duke let go of her face and ordered her to leave. Layla didn't remember how she reached the house. She said goodbye, turned, and walked down the path, but her head was like a fog. She washed her face near the well to regain some consciousness. The only thing she remembered clearly was the deep and silent blue eyes that had swallowed her like a river. Also the temperature of hot hands and the feel of a finger touching her lips. She felt pain and shame. Back in the room, Layla thought about how she never wanted to face the Duke again in her life. The one, just the same, was sitting in the outhouse. Layla Livlin, who went out into the garden at the first opportunity to help Bill Ramir, had not been seen for several days. Not since the night she had come to the Duke for her glasses. He had held her in his arms that day and kept thinking of his feelings for the girl. And coming to a vain and mediocre conclusion, he let it go. Because emotions of this kind had always been under his control. But had he realized that by letting her go, she would drift so far away? He was no longer sure of that. The secretary approached the Lord and said that all the preparations for the hunt were ready. Kyle asked Leela if she was going to hang the laundry. He saw her walking with a basket of washed clothes and rolled up the sleeves of his shirt and volunteered to help. The girl had been busy running away from the Duke for the past 10 days. Kyle, hanging cloth on the ropes, asked his friend if they could take a walk around the neighborhood together when they were done. For example, to the riverbank where Leela's favorite tree grew. The girl replied that she wouldn't be able to go this time, as she still had a lot of unfinished chores to do around the house. She wouldn't even go near the forest and the river so she wouldn't run into the Duke. Kyle felt that there was something suspicious about it and said that it was strange that she had been sitting at home the last few days. He thought that once she found her glasses she would be even more active walking around everywhere, but it was the opposite. So why wasn't she wearing the glasses she had worked so hard to earn? Layla, stressed about having to deceive a close friend, said she was afraid of losing them again, so she would only use them for reading. When the Duke was away, she would come to the garden to help her uncle. 
and when he returned she would leave as if running away. She planned to live like this until the summer came to an end. Suddenly, the clatter of hooves and dog barking was heard very close by. Layla and Kyle turned around at the sounds. A group of hunters with the duke at their head were riding past them, down the path toward the forest. He turned around and looked intently at Layla. She, frightened and not wanting to meet his gaze, spread the sheet on the rope. As a result, only Kyle was visible and the girl was out of sight. Layla thought about the fact that when fall came, and Duke Gerhardt and Lady Claudine's engagement was announced and they were betrothed, they would immediately move to live in the city, and then the days would be quiet. One would just have to be patient. Kyle leaned over to his friend and asked how she was feeling. Knowing she would be uncomfortable with the sound of gunshots from the hunt, he suggested they go inside. She replied that she was fine, it would all be over tonight anyway. It was time to head back, changing the laundry that had been washed to the ones that were already dry and putting them in the hamper. Kyle volunteered to carry the things home himself, for which Layla thanked him. On the way, Layla thought about how once the Duke left Arvis, there would be peace in her small world. She also thought about going to the forest in the evening, as there would be many poor birds that needed to be buried. The Duke told the group that they could go back to the mansion already, and he wanted to ride through the forest alone for a bit longer. Everyone quietly left the forest master to his domain. Sunset came, Matthias rode along the path and shot one bird after another, turning them into a bloody trail. As always, today's hunt had been a success. But he didn't feel satisfied. He supposed it was because of the bird desperately avoiding him. Leela walked down the path, noticing that there were even more wounded today than usual, judging by the fact that after walking only a few steps, she saw the dead bird again. Digging another hole, she thought about how much she hated the Duke having such a terrible hobby. But something was wrong here, she buried birds every year, but she had never made graves at such frequent intervals as she did today. Layla had a bad feeling about this. She decided to bury one more bird that caught her eye and return home afterward. And so after walking down the path some more she ran into the duke, who was waiting for her, sitting on a rock. He told her to go on. She must do her work. Layla realized at once that he had waited for her to come to bury the birds on purpose, and had lured her here by shooting so many unfortunate creatures. A bird with a red ribbon on its paw lay on the ground in front of her. She had tied it around the feet of the plover chicks that had hatched on the banks of the Scherter River last year. The bird, returning from wintering in a far southern country, had finally given up life where it was born. For the minor amusement of a man. Layla began to dig and the duke asked her if she had tied the ribbon. The girl answered yes and then the duke asked why it was necessary. Layla said she wanted to recognize the migratory birds back home. Even though she was hoping for a very different reunion, tears glistened in her eyes. Duke said her facial expression looked like she wanted to condemn him. But what was the problem? He was only hunting his birds in his own grounds. Layla said the birds don't know anything about it, do they? They were just born here and raised here and they consider this forest their home. It's a place you want to come back to, even if you fly far away. Then Matthias asked if he had to worry about the bird's feelings too. Leila said no, but was there any point in doing such a cruel hunt? The man did not know that these words had cost Leila much more courage than when, as a child, she had taken a train to another country with only one address in hand. Then the Duke clarified, is it possible to hunt tenderly and with love? At that moment Leila felt ashamed and blushed. She apologized for crossing the line with her words and for her rude behavior. The Duke asked her why she liked birds so much. Layla replied that she didn't think the story could be of interest to the Duke. She buried the bird, bowed to him, and told him that she had finished her work, so she was going home. Just as she turned around, the Duke shot a new bird and said he didn't think her work was done. Layla asked the Duke to tell her straight, what had she done wrong to him that he was punishing her like that? The Duke replied with a nonchalant look that punishment was out of the question. He was just doing his job hunting, and she was doing hers burying birds. Then he asked again why she liked birds so much. Her whole life flashed before the girl's eyes how her mother left her and went away without even turning around. How she wandered from relative to relative and no one wanted her. And the long train ride. She said that wherever she went, the birds always accompanied her. And even if they flew away, they always came back. They were her first friends with whom she didn't feel abandoned or lonely. 
Everywhere she saw the birds, they cheered her up with their presence. Tears flowed from her eyes and she said that surely this fact was meaningless to Duke. She immediately began wiping her cheeks with her hands and asked the man if he would still do such a hunt. He replied that he would if he had to. Then he looked at his pocket watch and told Leila that he wanted everything in his world to be where it should be. Exactly where it should be, without hiding or running away unnecessarily. Leila asked what that meant, and Matthias told her not to leave her place. He got on his horse, and the girl said she didn't know what he was talking about at all. Then the duke said that she must think over his words properly. And then he added that perhaps if she found the answer to that question he would give her a very affectionate hunt, 